My name's Ethan, and I'm 27. My wife, Alyssa, is a year younger at 26. My dad, Mark, is 52, and my mom, Linda, just turned 50. Like anyone else in this situation, I never thought something like this could happen to me. But, as the story goes, it did. Based on what I've heard from others who've gone through this, it seems like you all enjoy a bit of backstory. So, I'll do my best to keep it clear and detailed. Alyssa and I first crossed paths during her freshman year of college. We lived in the same dorm building, and it wasn't long before we officially met. Funny enough, we later realized we only lived two towns apart back home, which made things convenient. Whenever we headed home for breaks, I'd let her ride with me. It added about 20 minutes to my drive, but it wasn't a big deal. After several trips together and spending time at school, we started dating. My family is pretty tight-knit, and hers seemed the same way, so we wasted no time telling them about each other. I'd met her family a few times when dropping her off, but it was mostly just quick introductions and small talk. Both of our families welcomed the relationship, and over time, it grew stronger. Since I was a year ahead of her, I graduated first and moved back home. Lucky for me, I landed a solid job with great pay right out of the gate. I visited her at school as much as possible, and whenever she was back home, we made sure to spend time together. Once she graduated, she moved in with me since both of our jobs were near the city we grew up in. Like me, she got a good paying position at her company. We lived together for about three years, and then I proposed. We've been planning the wedding ever since. Now, here's where things start to go downhill. Looking back, there were so many signs I foolishly ignored. I thought my dad was just trying to be welcoming, getting Alyssa comfortable with the family. He'd call her a lot, and whenever I'd overhear, they'd brush it off as talking about upcoming family events or things like that. One time, Alyssa was in the shower, and her phone rang. It was my dad. I picked it up, thinking nothing of it. The moment he heard my voice, though he sounded thrown off and almost annoyed, I asked him what was up, and he mumbled something about needing to talk to Alyssa about my mom's birthday, which was coming up. We ended the call, and I didn't think twice about it. Writing this out now, I can't believe I didn't catch on sooner. The day I found out started like any other. It was a Thursday, and Alyssa had the day off, so she made breakfast for both of us. As I was getting ready to leave for work, she kissed me and told me to have a great day. On the drive, I realized I'd forgotten some important paperwork I needed for a meeting later that afternoon. I figured I'd swing by the house during lunch to grab it. Alyssa sent me a few casual texts throughout the morning, asking what I wanted for dinner and if I needed her to hang up my laundry. I didn't mention I'd be stopping by at lunchtime. There didn't seem to be any reason to. When I pulled up to our building, I noticed a car in the lot that looked just like my dad's, but I brushed it off and parked. I walked inside, and when I opened the door, I felt like I'd stepped into some bad, cliché movie scene the kind where the husband comes home early and catches his wife in the act. There was a trail of clothes, both his and hers, leading straight to our bedroom. Faint moans echoed through the apartment. I stood there, frozen, my mind trying to process what was happening. If someone had been watching, I must have looked like a statue. After what felt like forever, I finally snapped out of it and pulled out my phone to start recording. I picked up all the clothes lying on the floor and tossed them into the hallway. Then, with my phone still recording, I made my way to the bedroom. The door was wide open. I stood there for a good minute, filming before I flipped the light switch on. The sudden brightness made them both jump. My heart sank when I realized the man in bed with Alyssa was my own father. They were too stunned to speak at first. But once my dad saw I was recording, he went into full panic mode. He scrambled to grab anything he could to cover himself, all while begging me to stop filming. He wrapped a towel around his waist and started coming toward me. I warned him, if you don't want to get hurt, don't take another step. But either he didn't care or didn't hear me, because he kept coming. 
so, I punched him square in the jaw and he went down hard. His head bounced off the doorframe as he crumpled to the floor. Alyssa let out this horrified scream, but I aimed the camera right at her. You're worried about him. I spat. But nothing to say to me, huh? After a minute, my dad came to, and I told them, I just came by to grab something for work, so I'm heading back now. If either of you worthless pieces of trash are still here when I get back, I'll send this video to everyone you know. I stopped recording and turned to my dad, who was still trying to pull himself together. You're dead to me, I told him. You're no longer my father. You might want to get home soon, though, because I'll be talking to mom real quick. I sat in my car for a while, just staring blankly, until one of my bosses called to ask where I was. I told her I'd be back soon. When I handed her the paperwork in her office, I must have looked awful because the first thing she asked was, what's going on? You okay? I tried to brush it off, telling her I'd be fine, but she wasn't buying it. She stood up, her eyes fixed on a bloodstain on my collar, and said, you're bleeding. I glanced down and calmly replied, that's not mine. It's my father's. Her face filled with confusion, so I took out my phone and showed her the video. She watched the whole thing, eyes wide the entire time. She'd met Alyssa a few times at company events, but not my dad. When the reality hit her, that Alyssa had cheated on me and with my own father, she just sat there in stunned silence for a minute. After the shock passed, she asked if there was anything she could do to help, suggesting maybe I take some time off. But I told her, I can't go back there right now. I just need a moment to clear my head, then I'll be ready for the meeting. I've got a spare shirt in my office. The meeting went fine, and somehow, I managed to slap a smile on my face like nothing had happened. Afterward, my boss came up to me again and asked how I was holding up. I just said, I don't even know, and went back to my office. After that, I headed home, and for the first time in a long while, I found myself completely alone. I knew right then and there that I needed to leave this apartment. I couldn't stay here anymore, and there was no way I was ever sleeping in that bed again. I also knew I needed to get checked for STDs. God knows what's been going on behind my back. And, on top of everything else, I think I may have broken something in my hand when I hit my dad. The next day, I tried to get in touch with my mom. I called her phone over and over, but none of the calls went through. I wanted to take her out to lunch and break the news to her face to face. After about a dozen attempts, I gave up on the calls and decided to drive to her place. She needed to know the truth, even though I knew saying it out loud would only rip the wound open again. The whole drive there, I rehearsed what I would say, but the more I thought about it, the more anxious I got. I had to pull over twice just to throw up. I mean, how do you tell your own mother that her husband's been sleeping with your fiancé? Anyway, when I finally pulled into the driveway, I sat there for a minute, trying to pull myself together, before I could even get out of the car. My mom came flying out the front door. She was furious. How dare you show up here after hitting your father? She screamed. He was just trying to break up a fight between you and Alyssa. She didn't hold back, calling me every name under the sun and accusing me of being an abuser. Then she had the nerve to tell me Alyssa wasn't ready to forgive me yet, and that if she had any sense, she never would. Apparently, my father had dragged Alyssa back to my parents' house and fed my mom some ridiculous story about how Alyssa and I had argued, and he was just trying to play peacemaker, but I lashed out and hit him. Mom went on and on, but I couldn't take it anymore. I finally snapped. Really, Mom? You seriously believe that? Your husband is sleeping with my fiancé. That's why I hit him. If you don't believe me, I'll send you the proof, but don't expect me to ever talk to you again after the way you've treated me. When you finally figure out that you're just as bad as he is, don't come crawling to me for an apology. Her face went pale, and I could see the shock in her eyes, just like I'd felt when I first walked in on them. I pulled out my phone, sent her the video, 
and watched as she stood there in disbelief. She got as far as the moment when I flipped on the light, then she stopped watching. She put her phone down and looked up at me, but I was already heading back to my car. As I backed out of the driveway, I glanced at her one last time. She was in tears, and as much as my heart broke for her in that moment, she'd said too much for me to turn around and make things right. When I got home, I started packing up everything that reminded me of Alyssa or my family. I boxed up all her stuff and set it by the front door. Legally, she's been living here so I can't just throw her out, but her name isn't on the lease. She tends to avoid conflict, but if she shows up for anything other than collecting her things, there's going to be plenty of it. I put everything related to my parents into storage. We used to be close, but I've never had a problem cutting out toxic people, and now it was their turn. I sent a text to Alyssa's parents, letting them know the engagement was off and that she'd been cheating on me. I thanked them for everything they'd done for me. We were still getting to know each other, but they had always been kind and supportive, which just made this betrayal cut even deeper. I asked if they could come and pick up her belongings because I'd rather not see her again. I haven't heard back from them yet, but I'm hoping they'll come get her stuff so she has no reason to return. As much as I wish I could say I'm doing alright, that'd be a lie. My emotions hit me like waves. Sometimes I feel numb, and other times I'm so angry I could explode. I haven't felt a single moment of peace since I found out. Besides a few close friends, I don't have anyone left, especially now that my family turned out to be a complete disaster. I knew I had to start getting my life back together, so I tackled the things that needed to be done, like getting tested, finding a therapist, moving, and of course buying a new bed. First, I called my doctor's office and told them I needed to get tested and asked for a referral to a therapist. My first therapy session was about two weeks ago, and we've been meeting once a week since then. I got tested last week, but it'll be another week or so before I hear back on the results. Cross your fingers for me. I also reached out to a real estate agent I know, and he sent me a bunch of listings. I settled on a refurbished cabin on the outskirts of the city, and I finished moving in two days ago. After I moved, I called Alyssa's parents again. I told them I was officially out of the apartment and mentioned that Alyssa hadn't come by to get her things. I also warned them that the landlord would start showing the apartment soon, so her stuff needed to be picked up before it got tossed. That must have lit a fire under them because, the next day, my former landlord texted me to thank me for getting the place cleared out. Now no one, neither Alyssa nor my parents, knows where I live except the friend who helped me find this place. The only downside? I traded a quick 10-minute walk to work for a 45-minute drive. My phone has been going off non-stop with calls and texts from Alyssa, my parents, and even some friends, but honestly, I don't want to talk to anyone other than my therapist right now. At work, I've been pretty much invisible. Come in, do my job, and leave. When I have to talk to someone, I throw on a fake smile and pretend everything's fine. My boss checks in on me often, but I don't open up much. I just thank her for her concern and tell her I'll be okay. The truth is, I don't know if I'll ever really be okay. They say time heals all wounds, but that only seems to work when you're dealing with one problem, not when you lose the three closest people in your life in one fell swoop. It feels like a part of me died, and there's no way to bring it back. Therapy's been helpful, I guess. I've never done it before, so I don't really have a benchmark for what good therapy looks like. We get along well, though, and she genuinely wants to help. The first session was just getting to know each other and going over what led me there. By the second session, we started digging deeper. She asked me about my relationship with my parents, and I told her it had always been solid until recently. We used to talk a lot and had a great home life growing up, but now all of that is just meaningless. She wanted to know why I cut my mother off, so I told her straight up that my mom said things to me that I wouldn't even say to someone I hated. And once you cross that line, there's no coming back. At the end of my last session, I shared the link to my YouTube channel with her so she could hear more of what I'm going through. So, 
If you're listening to this, hey there, doc. Right now, I'm still feeling miserable. I thought I'd be in a better place by now. Not necessarily happy, but at least okay. I know part of it is on me for not reaching out to my friends, but even the idea of responding to them feels exhausting. I know they'll want to come over or hang out, but I don't have the energy for that yet. Until I do, I'll keep working, going to therapy, and sitting on my back deck, sipping cheap whiskey and trying to enjoy the view. I haven't gone hunting since high school, but with this new place, I could probably hunt right from my porch. Might give it a shot. On a brighter note, I'm happy to report that my STD tests came back clean, which is a huge weight off my shoulders. I'm also finally settled into my new place. When I said I bought a refurbished cabin, I may have exaggerated a bit. It was refurbished about 25 to 30 years ago, so it's a little outdated. With all this newfound free time, I've taken on some renovations myself. The only thing left to do is paint the guest room, which I've turned into a home office. I stayed away from the electrical and plumbing work, though. I've got no interest in getting electrocuted or dealing with sewage pipes. Renovating this place has actually been a great way to relieve stress and clear my head. I'm still seeing my therapist once a week, and honestly, it's probably the only thing keeping me afloat. Being able to vent, express my frustrations, and get solid advice has been invaluable. I'm still working at the same company, but I've started opening up a bit more to a few of my closer co-workers and my boss, thanks to my therapist's advice. With her encouragement and some nudging from you all, I've even started reaching out to my friends again and am slowly getting back into the swing of things. Now, let me update you about my so-called family and my ex. After a lot of thought, I finally decided I was ready to talk to my mom. About a month ago, I unblocked her number and gave her a call. She picked up almost immediately, and I could hear the panic in her voice. Once I reassured her it was me, I suggested we meet, and she agreed without hesitation. The next day, we met at a diner near her house. She was already there when I arrived, and the moment she saw me, she started quietly sobbing. When I sat down, she kept apologizing, saying she could only believe what she had been told because she never imagined in a million years that my dad and Alyssa would be involved. I told her I appreciated the apology, but that what she said to me was disgusting, things no mother should ever say to her son. It revealed what she truly thought of me, and I couldn't just forget that. She broke down even harder and swore it wasn't true. She tried to explain that she was furious when she heard I'd hit my dad, and when I showed up at the house, she let her anger control her. Not wanting to rehash everything, I let it go and changed the subject, asking her what she was doing about my father. She told me she had separated from him the day after I sent her the video and had already contacted a lawyer. As for Alyssa, my mom said that after I left her house, she couldn't stand the sight of them anymore, so she threw them both out. We talked for about an hour, but before I left, I told her flat out that because of what she said to me, I didn't have my mother when I needed her the most, and because of that, I didn't know if I could have her in my life again. I was willing to work on things, but only at my own pace. As I stood to leave, she stopped me, saying she had something important to tell me. I reluctantly sat back down, and that's when she dropped the bombshell. Alyssa was pregnant. Apparently, Alyssa had shown up at my mom's house and admitted she wasn't sure if the baby was mine or my father's. She asked my mom if I had been in touch because she wanted to let me know. My mom hadn't heard from me, so she just sent Alyssa away. Hearing that news stunned me into silence. Alyssa, pregnant, and there was a chance the baby could be mine. I couldn't even wrap my mind around it. I got up and left the diner without saying another word. My mom called after me, but I was too overwhelmed to face her. I just got in my car and started driving with no destination in mind, eventually winding up back at the cabin, my temporary safe haven. The days that followed were a blur of confusion and anxiety. I couldn't bring myself to answer my phone or read the flood of messages that kept coming in. I wasn't ready to confront the emotions, the pain, or the uncertainty. 
My therapist encouraged me to face it head on, but the best I could do was write it all down in my journal, hoping to make sense of it somehow. I stayed disconnected from my closest friends. I couldn't bring myself to tell anyone about the pregnancy. The shame weighed on me like a heavy fog, making me feel hollow inside. I went through the motions, getting up, going to work, doing the bare minimum, and then leaving without talking to anyone. My boss tried to check in on me a few times, but I brushed her off with the same weak line, I'm fine, before retreating back to my solitude. About a week later, my mom left me a voicemail. Her voice was full of desperation as she urged me to speak to Alyssa and get to the bottom of the pregnancy. My therapist suggested I reach out to Alyssa's parents, thinking they might help facilitate a calm conversation. Hesitant, I finally sent them a message explaining my concerns and asking for their help setting up a meeting with Alyssa. They responded quickly, offering their support. When I finally met with Alyssa, she looked completely wrecked. Her eyes were swollen and bloodshot from crying, and she could barely meet my gaze. I'm so sorry, Ethan, she said in a shaky voice. I know I've done the worst thing imaginable, and I don't even know whose baby this is. Her words cut deep, but I stayed calm. Alyssa, I don't want to fight. I just need the truth, I told her. She nodded, and her parents arranged for a paternity test as soon as possible. Over the next few days, my mind raced with a whirlwind of fear and uncertainty. The thought that the child could be mine terrified me, but the alternative, if the baby was my father's, was just as horrifying. I couldn't stop thinking about the kind of life that poor child would have with my dad as a father. When the results finally came in, they confirmed my worst fear. The baby wasn't mine, it was my father's. Alyssa collapsed, sobbing uncontrollably as the weight of her betrayal hit her full force. Without saying a word, I turned and walked out, refusing to maintain any further contact with her. Rebuilding my life from this chaos feels impossible at times, but with the help of my therapist, I'm learning to navigate the storm, one step at a time. My mother was devastated, but she moved forward with the divorce. She wanted nothing to do with Alyssa or the child, and she cut my father out of her life completely. He tried to change her mind, but she stood firm. Alyssa, on the other hand, found herself estranged from both families, left to raise the child on her own. As for me, I focused on finding some sense of peace and rebuilding my life from the ground up. The cabin became more than just a place to stay. It became my refuge, my sanctuary. I poured myself into making it feel like home again, and little by little, I began reaching out to friends and opening up more in my therapy sessions. I talked about my fears, my grief, and the huge weight of betrayal that still hung over me. I knew I couldn't change what had happened, but I also knew I had to keep moving forward. No amount of time would erase what was done, but I had a choice in how I responded. The scars would always be there, but I was determined to find peace and embrace whatever new beginnings life had in store for me. I was trying to accept the reality that while the past couldn't be undone, the future was still mine to shape. Right now, my head's full of so many thoughts, and I don't even know how to feel or what to do next. I just wanted to share what I've been through and maybe get some advice. And to those who think this story is fake, believe me, I wish I had the kind of imagination to make something like this up. I'd be writing novels instead of working a 9 to 5. Thanks for sticking with me, and I'm sorry if I rambled too much.